So we've got really two items on the agenda. Um, update on our MFA implementation, and then um, an overview of our ERCAP system has been improved from last year. Okay, so let's start with MFA. All right, sounds good. Does that mic pick up pretty good? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, just uh, go ahead and go. Well, just first, I wanted to say this is um, we won't cover all the MFA. Kind of details in this. This is just an update. So, uh, if there are questions around other details of the implementation, they may not be answered in this deck. But what we wanted to talk about is just where things are and some of the things that we're doing to try to make it as painless as possible. Okay. So, next slide. So, um, I think this has been addressed in the past, but I just wanted to repeat it because I know a lot of people are probably asking, "Why are we doing this?" So. Um, just a couple of reasons. One, you know, the systems are a large investment. We need to protect them and make sure we're being good stewards of the, of the resources. And compromised credentials are one avenue that people can use to kind of further try to attack systems, you know, do further compromises or use it as a, a, as a vector for attack to other places too. So. Even if there's not a serious breach, it can still create a lot of work for everybody involved. And so, you know, we want to do everything we can to protect the systems. Uh, in the past, I think we've we've resisted MFA. NERSC has resisted MFA because it was people weren't very used to it. It was it was kind of a rare thing. But I think now it's become much more commonplace. Users are more accustomed to it. Most H of the H the DOE HPC centers have already implemented it and are require it. And then people are already used to using it in some of their web-based systems that they interact with on a daily basis now. And NERSC is really the only major one that isn't a major OSCAR facility that's not already requiring MFA at this point. Okay, so there's, there's that. So, um, you know, an obvious thing is this is gonna this is going to wreck my science. This is going to slow me down. We, you know, we know that the current model that we've had in place is is very, um, you know, lightweight. It's very easy. You get that. We're trying to look at ways to balance that. And when we've crafted the strategy, we've really looked for things that we felt like would be as low in its impact as possible. And we've tried to uh, implement uh, solutions and other kind of workarounds so that. Uh, people's workflows and processes uh, uh, are still pretty productive and efficient, All right? So what are some of the things that we're doing to make MFA a little easier? And yeah, unfortunately it's animated. Go ahead and yeah, just expand them on that. I think there's one more after this. Okay, so here are some of the things that we're doing um, to try to make it a little less uh, jarring. One is this uh, SSH proxy, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a couple of slides, but what this allows you to do is using your MFA, you can get a, a token, an SSH uh, certificate key that has a limited lifetime, so 24 hours, so at least it's enough for kind of a full day's work. You know, and so I've actually been, you know, trying to uh, eat the dog food here. I've, you know, opted into MFA, uh, you know, many, many months ago when we first started rolling it out, before we had this service, and I, you know, it was a little bit frustrating because you drop a connection and then you'd have to go through the process again. This SSH proxy is already, I, I feel like it makes a difference because I can just do that in the morning and get going. We're going to be, we'll be turning on my proxy for the MFA for my, the my proxy service uh, very soon. People may think like, well, that doesn't affect me because I don't use grid stuff. Actually, you do, you just may not know it. So if you use Manu, if you use uh, minors.gov behind the scenes, that's my proxy. So you will see, we're gonna be changing the login process to, to reflect that. Shibboleth was another um, sort of sign-on service that we use for the health system and some other access systems. That's already been enabled. So if you've got MFA enabled on your account and you've logged into help recently, you'll notice that it asks for your MFA password. Um, it's, it seems to be fairly intuitive. So most people probably already um, done it without even thinking about it. 
And then last, uh, HPSS, what we'll do there is we'll use MFA to obtain the tokens. So you won't have to use MFA every time you interact with it, HPSS, it's just when you, when you generate your token. Slide. So we are currently in the opt-in phase of MFA rollout. Um, and so, you know, users that are ready and willing can go into NIM and enable it. Go ahead and uh, move up. Here's the second one. Can go into uh, to NIM and enable it and uh, register a token and start using it. But in the not too distant future, um, we will be switching over to opt out. And so that is currently scheduled to happen with the allocation year changeover. Um, we're tracking adoption rates and that will help us kind of bracket things. We may make adjustments based on how, how the response is going. Um, once we switch to opt out, then it'll be, the process will be the um, users will need to request and give a justification for why they need to have MFA disabled. And, um, you know, just because I don't like it will maybe not be a sufficient uh, reason, but if it's, if there's something where it really is inhibiting your, your science, then we're definitely going to consider that. Next slide. Uh, another thing that I um, just want to mention, the, the system we rolled out is based on uh, what's called time-based OTP, and the most popular implementation that is Google Authenticator, but there are other app-based models out there that you can get. Go, I think there's a couple, yeah. Um, so, for example, Authy is an app that you can get both on devices as well as on the desktop. And there are mechanisms for us to do YubiKeys uh, with our system as well if you don't have, if users don't have access to a, smart, uh, a smartphone device. So there are backups. I think for the most part we're expecting, you know, 95% of the users, if not more, will already have a smartphone, they'll just use that because they're a customer. Right, next one. So the SSH proxy, this is one of the things that I was explaining that we're hoping will uh, lower the pain level a little bit for using MFA and accessing the systems. I think there's a, again, yeah, so just, you know, Abe really likes the animated slides, unfortunately. Uh, there, I think that's the last one. So it's analogous, if you've ever used my proxy on sort of the grid side, that's, it's, it's very similar to that. The idea is like you authenticate, you get back a token. In this case, it's an SSH public key pair with a certificate. And you use those um, credentials to then do your SSH connections. And, um, the, the certificate model is already well supported in most of the common SSH clients. There are some places where it may not be supported and where we are in the process of implementing some kind of alternate methods that will work for those. So, for example, some of the Windows SSH clients may not support Is it Cup at 10? Yeah. Okay, so when you do the SSH proxy, it's already MFA enabled. It'll give you a, the default uh, lifetime is 24 hours and have processes uh, through ServiceNow of forms that you can use to request longer, um, longer lifetimes if there's, you know, it's kind of strong reasons for it. Um, so specifically, we're thinking about things like um, if you have kind of automated workflows or instruments that you're sort of kicking off uh, um, workflows from, you know, that might be cases where we'd want to, we'd consider granting longer, longer lifetimes. And uh, it, you can even interact with the proxy service uh, through an API. It's just based on a, a simple sort of RESTful API. And but but for the most part, what we expect people to do is we have some scripts already available that kind of hide most of that logic, and they just prompt you for a password, and you get a certificate stored in the right spot. Okay. So this is sort of what it looks like in action. Click click click. Okay, so here's my .ssh directory on my laptop. You can see, you know, I have sort of the normal files there. There's no nurse key at this moment. So I'll run this SSH proxy script, prompts me for my password and OTP, I enter it, and now um, it tells me that it's created this new key for me. 
files. When, so now if I look in there, I'll see these new, uh, these new files. So I can then use those to connect into Corey, for example, and you know, everything is as normal after that. And that certificate would work for you know, 24 hours. <clears throat> right, next uh, slide. Another thing you can do is you can add this into your SSH configs so you don't have to bother typing out the dash I options and stuff like that. So um, that's the other thing. All right, now that's fine. Shibboleth, I, I don't think there's much to say here. I've just got a couple of screenshots, but if anybody has MFA enabled and they've logged in, you know, this is what you'll see. You'll see the normal sort of regular username password screen. And then next. And then if you have MFA enabled, then it'll, it'll prompt you for your MFA password. You enter it. And then that, again, should last for 24 hours. It should work across other, other SHIB enabled resources at NERSC, but there's, we've actually been talking about that, trying to see if there's some exceptions there. But in general, even if it's not quite as single sign-on as it's, it's supposed to be, for, I think for most people, they'll be interacting with help and, and I've been using this already, and it, it prompts you once, and then you don't see it again for, for a day. The next screen. Jupyter, just a note that we are also working on adding a clear kind of MFA-enabled sign-on for Jupyter. This is kind of what it's going to look like. We already have this in, in prototype. We, might, we hope to get it deployed in the next couple of weeks, if not sooner. Um, but there again, username, your regular LDAP password, and then you type in your MFA uh, if you locked it in. And opt out, I can't remember what we had here. Okay, it's really weird. I, I should have changed the heading there. So one uh, question, if there's people wondering about password resets, those procedures will work as the same as they always did. So there's no MFA kind of variations at, the, at this point on that. If you need to change your token, you would just go into the token management part of the NIM interface and you can delete a token and create a new one if you need to. All right. Yep, good, good, good. I keep going through. Uh, I'll, I'll forget your phone. Oh, uh, yes. When you're saying, okay. Yeah, just uh, be sure to to kind of clean those things out, but you can go into NIM again and you can delete any tokens that you're not using any, any longer. So if you misplace the token credential somehow or you know, you the app gets deleted and the information gets just to delete that token from, from NIM and, and generate a new one. Okay, and I thought I had something in here. Advancing. Anyway, advancing. Uh, tech, technical issues. Okay, that was it anyway. All right. Okay, so um, the one thing I, I meant to add a slide on and didn't is the opt out procedure. Both the opt out and the, the longer lifetimes, there are forms already set up in service now, and we'll have links to those in the MFA documentation on the websites. Um, if when the time comes for people to actually request uh, some kind of uh, either opt out or longer lifetimes. In general, what we're really going to try to strongly encourage is let's see if we can make a longer lifetime certificate or something like that work first. And if we get to a place where there's just really is a, a, a serious reason why I can't, can't work for you, then we'll, we'll use the opt out process. So any, any questions? How is it going to look for NX users? Uh, NX, we're we're working on that right now. We um we can enable MFA already. That part is not a problem. The, the thing we're trying to do is you get this annoying part of like once you're in NX, then you have to get you get prompted again for your password when you jump over to Corey or Edison or you know one of the compute resources. So we're trying to come up with a mechanism to but remove that either through uh, some sort of host trust model or another thing we've looked at is like you just would generate a key pair that would only work there and it would last for a really long time, like a year or something like that. So 
one way or another, we're going to come up with a solution. For now, um, we haven't enabled it on Linux, but we'll, we'll be doing it once we know we have a, a good workaround in place. Good question. Yeah. Hi, Shane. Paul Hargrove here. I have a question about um, automated processes and how they should be working with MFA. Um, yeah, so what we would most likely do is that would be a, a, an example where you'd ask for these longer lifetimes. And the form that we have for that, um, I should have posted a link to it. It asks questions like, how long do you really need these to last? Some justification for why. And then um, some information about like, are there certain hosts this will originate from? Or is it only for, are there other constraints of like how this would normally be used? Because the whole point is to try to limit the exposure with these longer uh, keys as much as we feasibly can. So, right. Yeah, I, I think we're on the same page then because we have automated testing and runs midnight every night. No one's going to sit there with a phone at 11.59 every single night to okay. invent Right, yeah. Um, but I was, no, I was actually wondering if uh, working on the other side of the authentication barrier whether there was going to be any sort of standardized support for uh, cron or other automated things that would start, you know, on a Cori or Edison login node um, as, a, as an alternative. We already have, um, I think that what we say is we have the workflow nodes and those are places where we, we consolidate cron jobs. Um, so that's one, certainly one option. Um, and then we're also looking at other, you know, down the road, other modifications to kind of the new protocol, which could give another kind of REST-based interface for how you might launch jobs as well. But that's still a work in progress. All right, but if all else fails, it is a possibility to get uh, either opt out completely or uh, very long lifetime SSH keys that would have quarterly or something renewals. Right, something like that. It could be, you know, multi-month kind of lifetime. So you don't have to, you just have to make your calendar reminder to go update it, you know. Sounds reasonable. I'll definitely follow up in the, probably in the, in the, in the help system. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, it sounds great. Other questions? All right, good. If there are, um, you know, again, just ask, uh, file a ticket and that will get routed to the MFA team and we'll, we'll get back to you with, with details on things. So don't hesitate to ask. And again, our goal was to make, uh, to keep you guys running smoothly. So we're going to try to work with you to, to make it, make it work. All right. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. All right. So, um, up next we have our, our cap system tutorial. Hi folks, uh, Clayton Bagwell from the user engagement group. And, uh, many of you know me from past uh, exposure to ERCAP. Um, so ERCAP is the Energy Resource Computing Allocations Process. Uh, if you want to have the computing time at NERSC, you have to submit an ERCAP request. If you have an ongoing project, you have to submit a renewal request for next year to keep your project running. Um, so we collect um, science objectives and other types of information in ERCAP that's evaluated uh, both by uh, the DOE Office of Science and by also some of our data folks here. Um, and once everything is reviewed, uh, we'll make um, the award announcements uh, around December. Um, so the deadline for your renewal or cap request for um, 2019 is October 15th. Um, and that gives time for uh, DOE to review everything and give the information back to us. And then, of course, the new allocation year starts January 8th of 2019. Maybe it works. Maybe it oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you use the um, ERCAP.NERSC.gov uh, URL. This will take you directly into the ERCAP um, homepage. Um, you see it's been redesigned from last year. Um, at the top are the buttons for requesting requests, submitting requests 
for um, uh, the current year, uh, 2018, for, for the remainder of the year. We'll accept those up until November. For 2019, and if you're submitting a renewal request, that's the green button right there in the center. That's the one you want to look for. Um, we've also added uh, sections for where your draft requests will show up while you're still working on them. So if you have um, authorized preparers or what used to be called PI proxies and you want to share in preparing their cap requests, that's where you'll see uh, the draft requests. Once those are requests are submitted for review, they'll end up in the, the next section. Um, you can watch the progress, hopefully, uh, while they're being evaluated. And then the very bottom are your previous requests from uh, the last couple of years. Um, so if you don't use the ERCAP.nurse.gov uh, URL and you just go to like help.nurse.gov and you end up in the help desk area, uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, an ERCAP menu option. And under there is a, a link to ERCAP requests. Or if you end up in self-service, there's also a link there that takes you to the ERCAP requests homepage. So we help you find your way around in multiple ways. Okay, so again, we've redesigned the ERCAP uh, request form from what it was last year. Uh, and if you've been um, with NURSE for uh, at least a couple years, you'll see that it's reminiscent of the old NIM ERCAP version of the uh, form, uh, where we've taken the questions and we've divided them up into tabbed sections down at the bottom. So important stuff is at the top, subject, title and name, uh, the PI, uh, your DOE office and program that you're supporting and science category. Um, and then everything else is below. So okay, so we've tried to include uh, a number of different helpful things that through filling out the form. So we've included um, help text in various colors. Of course, red is a little more important, um, but blue is also helpful. Uh, we have found that some people have looked at the form and they just don't even see it. <laughs> but I just wanted to point it out. If you see something in blue, there's probably some help text there that will help you out. Um, we also included these asterisks uh, next to the, um, uh, the question labels and also in the tabs. So those are mandatory items that have to be filled out. Um, if you read asterisk or you see an asterisk in a tab, you know that there's something there that you need to fill out. Uh, the red asterisk next to the labels, once you fill those in, they'll turn gray. And once you filled out all of the questions in a tab that has an asterisk yeah. next to it, uh, those asterisks will go away. Uh, we also tried to include um, uh, hover text um, for some of the questions uh, to give a little more explanation uh, of what we're looking for rather than try and clutter up the, uh, the form with lots of instructions and stuff. And uh, if you see something with a, uh, a question mark in a, in a circle, that's a link that'll take you to another page uh, within NURSE with uh, additional information that will help you decide what to answer that question with. Uh, so we have uh, a number of lists for you to select um, answers from, and we have different options for you to search through those lists. So in the upper left there, you see if you put in just a couple of asterisks, it'll show you kind of a, uh, a pop-down menu list of beautiful options. If it's fairly long, um, you go down to the lower left, you can type in a word, and it'll search for everything in the list that contains that word. That helps you to reduce uh, your options. Uh, and for a really, really long list, like the science categories, if you just click on the magnifying glass, that'll give you a pop-up with all of the, um, the options, and you can also do a search 
um, within that list to help reduce it down uh, to what you're looking for. Um, in the past, we've had um, our, our offices and programs kind of combined together. Um, but now we, we have them kind of subdivided. So you have a high level office like high energy physics and the allocations manager there likes to report their requests under different categories. And so they've given us a list, list of what those subcategories are. Uh, so if you select high energy physics, this sub program box will sh pop up and then you can select uh, the appropriate sub program uh, to add to your list. Um, okay, so authorized preparers. Um, so in the past, we've had what's called the uh, PI proxy. Um, we're kind of doing away with that title and role, uh, but we still have the ability for you to add people as uh, authorized preparers to help you with um, filling out your request. Uh, you can just type a name down in the, the bottom there and search for um, active nurse users uh, to give them the authority to help you fill out your ERCAP request. And what we've tried to do is uh, from the past um, ERCAP requests, anybody who was uh, identified as a PI proxy, we automatically brought them over for renewals uh, as authorized preparers. Um, you know what I think is missing? Maybe I go to it later. No, I don't. Uh, could you back up? Uh, the one that has the asterisk on. Yeah, right there. Okay. Um, so also when you're, um, I, I missed a slide here. So if you're doing a renewal and you clicked on that green uh, submit a renewal button, um, it'll check this box that says this request is a renewal. And then you have to put in the number of the previous requests that you want to renew. And when you do that, that will copy over um, a lot of information from the previous request into this one so you don't have to repeat filling it out. Um, so it, it'll, if you click on the magnifying glass, it'll, again, it'll give you that pop-up list with your previous ERCAP request. You just click on an ERCAP number and it will go in and fill in stuff like your project title and short project name and some of the other information. Um, of course, there are, um, that was a nice tone. Um, so like for science categories, uh, we changed those again this year. Um, down about three. Here we go. Uh, we've changed the science categories again. Uh, we tried to make them more complete and inclusive. Um, and you'll see that the original, uh, the full list is 50, is that 50 or 56? 56 options. Um, and again, you can do a search uh, by typing in a word and it will reduce that list down to a more manageable uh, selection there. Um, if you still don't see the science category that you feel you should um, have on your ERCAP request, uh, there is a feedback a question towards the end of the, the ERCAP request. You can provide that information to us and We'll see if we can do that. Like next year's list even more inclusive. Let's see. We did. We did offer. Well, we did offer us preparers. Oh, we must have just accidentally skipped, skipped it over. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. Now we're on. All right. So now funding. Uh, if you have funding from the DOE Office of Science, um, we've included uh, the actually the. The DOE uh, program managers have asked us to include the list of the program managers for each office. So the first thing you'll do is you'll select the funding office, and then you put in your double asterisk, and you'll get the list of all the program managers that we know about. If they're not on that list. There is a not listed option, um, and you should 
include the, the program manager that you're working with in the, the next field with your grant uh, information. Um, if you have money from another source other than the DOE Office of Science, like there are other DOE Office of Energy, DOE, yeah, DOE Office of DOE offices like energy and efficiency and uh, those types of people. Um, you can select uh, those funding sources here. Uh, you can select multiple ones and you can fill up that entire box up there if you want to, if you have all that kind of funding. Uh, and then of course the, the grant information will be in the box below that. Um, so I know this sounds like we're asking you to do double work and we probably are. Uh, but so the, the top, uh, this is your project description. Uh, the top box is um, the easy to understand scientific American level project description uh, that people who are not in your field will understand what you're doing. Uh, the second box is the new one that we're asking you to add uh, this year, which is, this will be your technical description. This is the one that the DOE managers are more likely to be interested in. Uh, what you're actually trying to do and accomplish. Um, so sorry for the extra work, um, but that was something that was requested of us. Okay. Um, of course, you if you've if you're doing renewal, you've been busy and you've published all types of interesting um, scientific information in journals and stuff. Um, we're collecting that as usual in the refereed publications. Um, you also know that on some of these text boxes, um, we've kind of reduced the size. Uh, so in this particular example, uh, we've gone over by 824 characters. Um, there's a little Easter egg in there that I'll tell you about if you're brave enough to stay to the end of the um, presentation. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't think you can fit everything in this text box, put your most important and um, prominent uh, publications in here, and then you can um, include a longer list as an attachment to your request. So attachments. Um, at the top of the request, you want to look for a little paper clip. Um, that's how you add attachments to your request. Uh, when you click on that paper clip, uh, you'll get a pop-up box, uh, which is the one there in the center. You can go and look for uh, any documents on your computer, your, um, your drive or desktop or whatever, and they'll upload. And then once it's uploaded uh, in the lower left, you actually click the X to get rid of that box, but it's not getting rid of the attachment. It's just closing the box. So you'll be good. Don't worry about it. And uh, we actually show you where those attachments end up in a couple of places. So uh, along the top of the, um, uh, the aircap request, you'll see where it says manage attachments. Those are where your attachments end up. They also end up in the, under the supporting information tab. Uh, you'll see there's a section down there uh, where they'll also show up. Uh, when you, if you want to save a copy of your request for posterity and reference to in, in the future, there's a create PDF button up in the um, top bar there. And when you click on that, uh, it, the system will create a, a PDF and it'll add it to the section of where your attachments are. Um, resources requested. Okay, um, all of these things um, are integer fields. So if you type in 25 million or you know, like down here way under a scratch space, we originally put in 1.25 terabytes. Um, the system will round your numbers. Go to the next one. Oh, I didn't. Oh, it's there, okay. So you'll see that the 25 million uh, actually got uh, reduced to just the integers of 25 hours. So if you want 25 million hours, 
you have to ask for 25000000. Otherwise, you end up with just 25 hours, which probably make you really sad. Okay. Um, okay, so um, your five most important um, codes that you use. Um, if you've listed codes on your previous request, that information will get copied over. Um, but if you've had a change of heart or you're using different codes, you probably want to go through that list and update it to what your most important codes are now. And the last important um, tab is um, what's called usage agreement, where you say that I, if I get a, re a request, I will, to the best of my ability, monitor the usage for my project. And if this is a renewal, I have, to the best of my ability, uh, made sure that all the usage was specified for my project. Uh, you type in your initials. It's kind of a, like a semi-electronic signature. Okay, um, so when you think you've answered all the questions and uh, you're all ready to go, there's a submit for review button. Um, we just double check with you. Are you sure you really want to submit your request? Click on okay. If there's something that you forgot, if you missed an asterisk somewhere, we'll give you a little uh, red message that says, no, oh, you forgot to fill in this. Go down and fill in this section. Uh, when you successfully submitted your request for review and you go back to the ERCAP homepage, you'll see it under the submitted requests under review section. Okay. Um, so if you have questions, you can contact us at any time. Uh, email to allocations at nurse.gov. Here you can be brave enough, you can call us at uh, 866 nurse option two for account allocation support. Um, if you've um, been struggling and you put it off to the very last minute and you're coming up on the October 15th um, deadline and you're, you just have a problem you can't figure out, we are gonna have uh, ERCAP office hours. Um, October 12th is a Friday, October 15th is the Monday. Um, We'll have a, a Zoom session like the one you're on now. We don't have a link for it quite yet, but we'll uh, set one up and uh, send the link out in the weekly uh, user email. Any questions? Hi, this is Stephen Bailey. I heard that there was going to be a change in how disk is allocated such that through the ERCAT process we could be requesting large amounts of project space, um, maybe augmenting the SLA process before. Did that come to fruition or what's the status of that? Um, well, the, the short answer is yes, you can request more disk space. The longer answer is we're still working on how we're going to uh, approve and allocate uh, those disk space requests. But if you feel you, you need more um, under the resources requested, you know, we show you in terabytes what your current quota is and how much you've used. Um, I, I guess it's a matter of if I would like, if I would have been buying 200 terabytes of date of, you know, SLA, should I be entering 200 terabytes in the cap and hoping that I get it for free or that's probably a question above the pay grade of anyone in this room. <laughs> so, uh, so you might want to um, uh, contact like Richard or Katie and ask them for their advice. Okay. So it, actually, I think well, I'm going to answer that. <laughs> Any other questions? No other brave souls out there? This is Stephen again. I'll ask another. 
it, you mentioned you were doing away with the concept of PI proxy. Is that just for the purposes of the ERCAP process, but they will still exist for the purposes of, you know, NIM group membership and quota management, et cetera? Yeah, so we're, we're actually changing the, the role in, in NIM from PI proxy to project manager. So you can, you can designate people as project managers to help you um, you, your new account request and the, the people on your project and the quotas that they're allowed and stuff like that. Uh, they just have a different title. Okay. However, and are those the same as the preparers or are, are those just two separate concepts now? Those, those are two separate concepts. So okay. authorized preparers are stuck in ERCAP. They can have as many authorized preparers as you want. Um, they can help you fill out your request. But when we um, provision the projects in NIM, uh, the authorized preparers will stay behind in, in ERCAP. And if you want to designate any of those people as a project manager, you have to do that manually um, in NIM. However, if you have people in NIM who are currently identified as PI proxies, we will convert their role to pro project manager, I said pro project manager uh, for the new year in NIM for you. If you don't want them to be a project manager, you need to change their role before that. Okay, thanks. Huh? Any other questions? Yeah. I guess you just explained everything so thoroughly that nobody has any questions. So. Or they're so confused they just can't figure just out what to ask. Don't even know what to ask. <laughs> well, we're saving them all for the office hours. Oh, oh, okay. oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I guess I have a question. Uh, we're, we're planning to change our PI to a different person. When, when's a good time to do that? Uh, Who are we talking to? Uh, Vicki Lynch from SNS at Oak Ridge. Okay. And how soon do you want to change your PI? Um, <clears throat> Very soon, but uh, I, I wonder if it's better to wait till after the allocations put in to change the manager, the PI. Um, you can actually you can actually change it when you do your renewal request, um, and it will uh, carry over into NIM uh, for the new year. Uh, so the current PI will will stick around for the rest of the year. And whoever you designate as the, the PI will, will become PI for next year. Okay. And it's something you can do yourself. In the past, we, we had used to have to contact account support and we had to do it for you, but um, you can actually do that in our cap request now. Okay. Good question. Are there any other questions? Okay, um, so resources, uh, here's a list of the DOE Office of Science uh, program managers. If you want to know who to contact with questions that get on their best side, you know, what do I need to include in my ERCAP request to get you to approve it? Um, account support um, and also allocation support, pretty much the same people. Um, so you can email us or submit tickets through the help.nurse.gov, um, which is the other half of the ERCAP system, or ERCAP's the other half of the help system, how we want to look at it. Two sides of the coin. Yeah. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for sticking around. About the Easter egg. You, you, no, they have to ask. Oh, come on, somebody ask about the Easter egg. What's the Easter egg? Okay, um, so we, while we were making uh, modifications to ERCAP, we found that um, the ServiceNow records had a uh, size limitation, which is one of the reasons why many of the text boxes have had their character limit reduced. However, we later found that, uh, well, what, what we had to do was um, uh, have ServiceNow create a special off-row table to accept the overflow of all this extra characters and stuff. Uh, and what it turns out is that 
even though it says that you've overgone your character limit, um, that information is still stored. It, it just goes into a different table, uh, which can't be counted. And you actually have about um, 5,000 character limit. Um, so uh, if you don't, if it says that you've over, overdone your character limit, uh, if you do a uh, uh, create a PDF of your request, you'll actually see all that information is actually there. Really? Yeah. Well, don't let that be an invitation to write up a novel. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Are there any additional questions? Otherwise, we'll let everybody go. All right. Well, thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you later.